Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to a brand new video. My name is Arfad. Today we're going to take a look at the hymn in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Um, this is the hymn of Christ, uh, chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. And I have a few literatures here, um, which I am going to read. I will not be able to read from all the commentaries that I have, but as you can see here, I have quite a number of literatures that I wish to read for you. Um, and so, these are the literatures. I have the NIV, um, we have the Tony Evans, and as well as we have the Believer's Bible Commentary. And so, this will be an evangelical approach versus the liberal um, approach, SPL Study Bible. And then, I'm going to take a look at the Hermeneia Commentary on Philippians. And then we're going to take a look at the Anchor Bible, um, Philippians. And you will see that there's a divide here between the hymn of Christ, what does it really mean to the evangelical literatures, from the evangelical literatures, as well as from the more liberal um, literatures. And you'll make up your own mind after this video, definitely. Um, but you already know that I approach things from a historical perspective, but not all of these literatures does so. And so you need to understand that the NIV, for example, is more theologically uh, theologically inclined, even though it has elements of historical criticism inside. Um, the SBL doesn't have any theological things in mind, but you can still feel some of the author's bias and so forth. Whereas if you go to the very historical, critical commentaries like the Hermeneia, as well as the Anchor Bible series, um, you know, these works are not for evangelical Christians. Um, but I will still encourage um, non-liberal Christians to actually read these literatures as well, just so that you can hear the other side. Um, but yeah, so it is, you need to understand the literatures uh, first before you actually buy them. And for example, if your pastor recommends you the NIV Study Bible, which is, you know, famous, a lot of churches in my country recommend the NIV Study Bible, the ESV Study Bible. And so, you know, that doesn't mean that you should only read the NIV or the ESV. You can even go ahead and read the, the SBL Study Bible. So on and so forth. Now, obviously, some people will say that this is not a fair comparison because I'm choosing literatures here. Um, I have study Bible, I have commentary, right? Um, but I also have a, a single volume commentary. I mean, a single book commentary like uh, Hermeneia and the Anchor Bible. But I do not have a single volume commentary, uh, a single commentary, single book commentary. For the evangelical literatures, right? because I don't, <laughs> and so I can only use. Um, I I chose I've chosen the NIV because it's you know it's very popular amongst evangelists, and I chose Tony Evans uh, Bible Commentary because you know Tony Evans is more even though he has some of his ideas that evangelicals don't agree, but he is considered the fundamentalist evangelical camps and believers bible uh, commentary most evangelical christians who are serious uh, would have this uh, and so i've chosen my literatures wisely and obviously i can um, bring along my tony evans i mean my macarthur study bible and macarthur bible commentary they're the same by the way um, but because I only want to bring three literatures, if not, you know, this video will be too long. But I've decided the Tony Evans instead because a lot of evangelists also um, do not agree uh, with MacArthur, so on and so forth. Um, but I found that they disagree more with MacArthur than uh, Tony Evans. And so which is why I've chosen uh, Tony Evans. And the NIV, obviously, is, is the gold standard for the evangelical church. All right. So we will begin um, with the NIV. This is the hymn of Christ, um, Philippians chapter 2, verses 
um, verses uh, 5 to 11. So I would turn to Philippians. You have not marked out the pages here, so I apologize. You have, you have to watch me flip through <laughs> these pages. Um, because I don't prepare my videos beforehand. I don't, you know, I don't have a lot of time and so on and so forth. And so we're going to have to find these Philippians. Here. Okay, here we go. Um, you know, I could give you background on what this book is about, um, but then this video will be way too long. So I'm just going to narrow it down to just this pericope, right? the hymn of Christ pericope. We'll go to chapter 2, um, verses 5 to uh, 11. And so uh, here we go. I will just read to you um, from the NIV translation. Okay. Uh, I'll read, but actually, it starts from verse 6, but I've chosen 5 for the context. In your Actually, the context is you know from chapter 1, but in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Okay? And this begins the hymn. Who, being in very nature God, comma, I, I, I should mention the comma because the comma is very important. Who, comma, being in very nature God, comma, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Okay? Rather, comma, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, comma, being made in human likeness, full stop, and being found in appearance as a man, comma, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to Christ, even death on a cross, exclamation mark. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, comma, the fam famous verse here. That at that time, that at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow, comma, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, comma, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, comma, to the glory of God the Father. Full stop. Yeah, the reason why I mention the comma uh, is because as you read the NRSV, and if you read other literatures as well, um, you'll find that. The hymn of Christ here is very important. Where you place the comma changes the meaning of the text. The Greek is very ambiguous. There was no, there were no commas, uh, so on and so forth, right? And so, different translation, different translator, feels that the comma, right? Wh where you put the comma, it said that Jesus is called God, the God, or Jesus is subordinate to God. Right? Is it the glory of Jesus um, um, to the glory of God the Father? Right? Um, or is it um, Jesus um, is actually God? So, so, I mean, uh, hopefully you are making sense here. But if you read it in Greek, um, you know that uh, in English, when you render it, the Greek is very ambiguous. Um, and so where you place the comma actually depends on the grammar um, that you choose. Right. Um, and so camps are divided here, and I don't think this hymn of Christ will ever be settled when it comes to the, the language-wise, which is why um, if you look at the historical, social-historical context, the philosophies and so forth, that should be the, the methods to use to, to determine whether it's the hymn of Christ actually saying Jesus is God, or is, or is it saying that Jesus is actually not the God? But glory be to the God, right? And so, um, language-wise, it's disputed, and we will never solve it because the Greek is ambiguous. And so, we have to look at the first-century context here because Paul wrote this, according to the majority of the scholars, even though there are scholars who believe that this hymn was a later introduction, right? Uh, and that is my position. Um, but if you look at uh, majority of the introductory textbook and majority of the scholars, um, they just take it that the Philippians hymn is Pauline because Paul had incorporated an ancient, quote-unquote ancient, hymn into his letter. I don't believe Paul uh, quote this. Right? I found that the minority position is... Uh, is much more appealing that it is actually not Paul but later redactor. Right? 
But we we'll take the majority of the consensus here and that Paul actually incorporated this hymn inside. Okay, and so Paul is aware of this hymn. So what Paul is what is Paul saying here? Is Paul saying that Jesus is actually God, right? Or Jesus is actually is subordinate to God, but glory be to the Father forever and ever, so on and so forth, right? And so we read um, the NIV here. Okay, I'm just gonna put here. Um, I'm going to read from 2.6 to 11. The poetic character of these verses is apparent. Many view them as an early Christian hymn. Right? And then see note on Colossians 3.16. Taken over and perhaps modified by Paul. If so, they nonetheless express his convictions. What convictions? It's very interesting. The subjects of uh, this, this passage are Christ's self-sacrifice and exaltation. Okay? Um, this is 2.6. Specifically, two six, uh, Philippians chapter two verse six, in very nature God, yeah, affirming that Jesus is fully God, okay? uh, and then nature, essential form, the sum of those qualities that make God specifically God, equality with God, the status and privileges that inevitably follow from being in very nature God, something to be used to His own advantage. Even though Christ had all the attributes of divinity, he did not use them for self-promotion, but rather in humility laid aside his glory. Okay? And then it's two seven, made himself nothing or emptied himself. He did this not by giving up deity, but by laying aside his glory. Meaning he put his glory aside. Okay, when he become a man. Okay. Um, he, he left his uh, godliness, glories, so and so forth. Um, there's a different, there's a lot of a uh, whole range of argument as to why this is so and so forth. We'll not get into, right? And submitting to the humiliation of becoming a man. Jesus is truly God and truly man. Okay? Another view is that he emptied himself, not of deity itself, but of its prerogatives, the high position and glory of deity, nature of a servant. The lowest status in that culture. This emphasizes the full reality of his servant identity. As a servant, he was always submissive to the will of the Father. Yeah. Uh, I've left a lot of the quotation, uh, the verses and references in brackets. Okay. Uh, but if you do only NIV um, study Bible, you turn to page chapter uh, page two zero eight six. Right. This is note um, chapter two verse eight. Appearance as a man. Not only was Jesus like, okay, like a human being, but he also took on the actual physical characteristics of a man. Humble himself, okay. Um, there's a note here. Um, obedient. How Jesus humbled himself. Okay, a servant obeys to death. Stresses both the totality and the climax of Jesus's obedience. Okay, on a cross. Heightened Jesus' humiliation. He died as someone cursed. Right? Crucifixion was the most degrading form of execution that could be inflicted on a person. And so the NIV here for, for note uh, 2.8 is saying that Jesus emptied himself and he humbled himself to become a human being because his purpose was to die for the sins of human being. And so Jesus um, go to the, uh, Jesus allowed himself to be humiliated at the cross, right? dying and saving for the sins of humanity. Um, this is also found in, in Paul's um, ideas somewhere else. Uh, note 2 9 here, exalted, yeah, and then quotations and so forth. Uh, this is very important. Okay, the name above every name. The name that is referred to is probably the title conferred on Jesus, um, not his proper name. Okay? By allusion to Isaiah 45, 23, Paul likely refers here to the divine name Lord, okay, uh, which in the Hebrew of Isaiah indicates the divine name Yahweh. Right? And so, uh, according to the NIV uh, commentators here, on, um, they are trying to say that the divine name here is actually Lord, right? and it corresponds to the the Old Testament uh, God Yahweh. So in this, in other words, 
They're saying here that Jesus is called Lord. Okay, the name that is uh, above every name is basically the, the name here is Lord. It's a title. It is not the name Jesus, right? It is the title given to Jesus, right? Which is Yahweh. And so Jesus is Yahweh. Um, 2, 10 to 11, bow. Okay, every knee shall bow, should bow. Um, uh, there's a reference here to Isaiah 45, 23. I'm sure a lot of you uh, are aware of this. God's design is that all people everywhere should worship and serve Jesus as Lord. Ultimately, all will acknowledge Him as Lord, whether willingly or not. Okay? And then, a uh, specific note here on 2.10. At the name of Jesus, in honor of His exalted position as Lord. Okay? Uh, meaning He is Yahweh. Right? Therefore, because of Christ, in, this is note 2.12. Therefore, for, okay, um, because of Christ's incomparable example, um, verses 5 to 11 here, obeyed okay? their obedience in line with the gospel uh, then my presence during the course of paul's second and third uh, missionary journeys okay work out your salvation work it out to the finish not a reference to the attempt to earn one's salvation by works but a reference to the expression of one's salvation in spiritual growth and development salvation is not merely a gift received once for all it expresses itself in an ongoing process in which the believer is strenuously involved. Okay, and then quotations here. The process of perseverance, humble service, spiritual growth and much, uh, maturation, yeah, fear and trembling, not because of doubt or anxiety, rather the reference is to an active reverence and a singleness of purpose in response to God's grace. Right. Uh, well, I've overread it. I was only supposed to read until verse uh, note il, uh, eleven, but I've read until twelve. <laughs> but either way, so from the NIV, we we can gather uh, that the hymn here refers to Jesus as God. Okay, basically part of the Trinity. Uh, that is what the NIV affirms. Um, we will now turn. To the Tony Evans. Okay. We'll turn to the Tony Evans. I'll refrain from making like um, I'll refrain from taking sides, uh, commenting on the notes. Because there's a lot of as I was reading, there's a lot that I could comment on, right? As to why I disagree so and so forth. But I'll re I'll reserve that. Um, because that is for you to, to decide. We will go to Philippians. Okay, the book of Philippians is after Ephesians. And this is the hymn of Christ here. Okay. Um, chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. This is Tony Evans' commentary, uh, page 1240. If you want to have a servant mindset, you should look to the ultimate servant, Jesus Christ, and adopt the same attitude he had. If anyone deserved to be served, it was the Son of God. He existed in the form of God, but he didn't consider his equality with God as something to be exploited for his own gain. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, meaning God assuming to become a man, assuming to be uh, I mean, assuming as a form of a man. As to what this form is, you know, we have to go to the um, monographs, right? But to save you the, the, to cut the long story short, this form is actually the form of a uh, human being. What did Jesus give up to do that? Well, he didn't empty himself of deity. He didn't stop being God. Rather, he took on human flesh and became a servant. He didn't let his deity stop him from expressing humanity. Like pouring water into a container, Jesus poured the entirety of his deity into the container of his humanity, resulting in him being fully God and fully man, just like the NIV. In theology, this is known as hypostatic union. Okay? Two natures in one person unmixed forever, right? 
So how could we adopt Christ's mindset? And this is going, going to the, the teachings here, preaching here, basically. Jesus could serve because he knew he was God. Service was never a threat to him because he never lost sight of who he was. He was never insecure in his identity. He knew his position with the Father. Similarly, when you know who you are, a saint and a son or daughter of God, rendering service won't be a problem. It's when you don't know who you are that serving becomes a problem. When you are unsure of your identity, you'll feel that serving is beneath you and that you'll fear and that you'll somehow be taken advantage of if you serve. 2 8. What did Jesus what did Jesus' service look like? He became obedient to the point of death on a cross. He died as a substitute substitutionary sacrifice so that he might atone for sinners. He died the death we deserve. That's the ultimate sacrifice. It is it's the ultimate act of service, but he could do it willingly because he kept the end in view. Note 2 9. A servant of Jesus thinks in terms of true greatness because that's what Jesus did. He understood true greatness so he could serve. What was true greatness for him? Divine exaltation. God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. False greatness is human exaltation. People will pump you up, but they will also stick a pin in your balloon. Jesus was after something more than the praises of people. He lived for divine recognition. Right? Um, there's a lot that I could comment here. Um, you know, because the previous verse actually, you know, this verse. Um, but we'll carry on here. 2.10 to 11. When you aim to please people rather than glorify God, you may receive some applause for a time and that you will be your reward. Unfortunately, though, you won't receive the approval and exaltation of God. It is preaching here, but I'll still read to you. Some divine exaltation comes in this life, but most of it comes in eternity. So if you want to be great, take advantage of every opportunity you can to serve others to the glory of God alone. Jesus could, sacrifice, Jesus could sacrificially serve humanity because he knew that one day every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, comma, to the glory of God the Father. Okay. All of life is to be the supreme recognition of the comprehension, comprehensive kingdom rule of Jesus Christ. This can now be done voluntarily, but one day all will do it mandatorily. Mandatorily. Okay. Um, that's it, basically. That's the hymn of Christ from the Tony Evans commentary. So basically what this... Um, uh, what we have just read, I'll just summarize to you, right, is that Jesus, he became a human being. God became a human being to die for the sins of humanity, right? And he still did not lose his div divinity. He knew what he was doing and that's the only reason why he is able to serve human being, right? It's because he became human being. All right, we'll now go to the Believer's Bible Commentary. Believer's Bible Commentary. By the way, I've reviewed all these books uh, in my channel, and you can actually uh, look up the individual reviews of them. <coughs> okay, so we'll go to Philippines. All right. Okay, here we go. Okay, this is page 206. 2006. Let this mind you, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul is not going to hold up before the eyes of the Philippians the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. What kind of attitude did he exhibit? What characterized his behavior toward others? Guy King has well described the mind of the Lord Jesus as um, the selfless mind, the sacrificial mind, the serving mind, the Lord Jesus consistently thought of others. Okay. Uh, we'll skip here. We'll go to verse uh, note 2.6. 
when we read that Christ Jesus was in the form of God, we learn that he existed from all eternity as God. It does not mean that he merely resembled God, but that he actually is God in the truest sense of the word. Okay? Yet he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now this is the passage, right? Here it is of utmost importance to distinguish between personal and positional equality with God. As to his person, his with a capital S, Christ always was, is, and will be equal with God. It would be impossible for him to give that up. But positional equality is different. Okay, there's a separation here between positional equality okay, um, and personal uh, equality. Right? We'll explain as to what that means. Uh, no, he will explain. From all eternity, Christ was positionally equal with his Father, enjoying the glories of heaven. But he did not consider his position something that he had to hold on to at all costs. Yeah, meaning he doesn't need to be God. He doesn't need to always be um, with the same essence as God. Because he is God, but somehow he can also not be God. Right? But his status will always be God. Meaning, he is considered God, but he can actually um, um, not cease. Right? For example, uh, a father. A father will always have the status of a father. Right? Um, but if his son died, he is no longer a father. Right? Um, and so, but he was... He is still a man and, you know, he, he, is, has, he can be a father and cannot be a father, but he will still be a man. And a man can only be a father. A man cannot be a mother. So that's what, I mean, as, as I read, it become clear to you what this author is actually trying, trying to tell you. Right? Um, but he did not consider his position something that he had to hold on to at all costs. When a world of lost mankind needed to be redeemed, he was willing to relinquish his positional equality with God. The comforts and joy of heaven, he did not consider them something that he had to grasp forever and under all circumstances. Okay? This, is very, this is a uh, key factor here. Thus, he was willing to come into this world to endure the contradiction of sinners against himself. God the Father was never spit on or beaten or crucified. Okay. Um, otherwise, it will be uh, patripassinism, the father suffers. Right? God the father was never spit on. Okay. Um, in this sense, the father was greater than the son, not greater as to his person, but rather as to his position and the manner in which he lived. Jesus expressed, okay, this, let me just take a pause here, in a manner in which he lived, right? God the Father is, quote-unquote, superior to Jesus in the manner in which he lived because Jesus, the Son, had to come on earth. Remember, this is also God, equal, okay, homoousios, equal with, uh, with God. But they're just different beings, uh, different persons, but they are the same being. Okay? And so, the Father has a superior lifestyle or a more comfortable lifestyle, I would say, because the father did not have to be spat on uh, to die on the cross. Whereas the son, which is also God, homoousios, okay, equal being, was spat on so on and so forth. So the, the comfort of living is not there for the, for the son, which is also God. Okay? But there's no three gods or two gods. There's only one God. This is something that you, sh you should understand here. Because this author is approaching things from a Trinitarian uh, perspective. Okay. Thus he was willing, okay, Jesus here, okay, thus he, the he here refers to Jesus. Thus he was willing to come into this world to endure the contradiction of sinners against himself. God the Father was never spit on or beaten or crucified. In this sense, the Father was greater than the Son, not greater as to his person, but rather as to his position and the manner in which he lived. Jesus expressed this thought, this thought in John 14.28. Okay. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father. Yeah, then so on and so forth. 
uh, he quotes uh, the Johannine uh, verse. Um, the author here quotes uh, Gifford. Yeah, I'll read to you. This is not the na- this is not the nature or essence, but the mode of existence that is described in this second clause. Did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Yeah, this is what the verse is. Uh, the author is trying to explain this verse. And one mode of existence may be changed for another, though the essential nature is immutable. Let us take Saint Paul's own illustration in two Corinthians. Um, um, eight, uh, chapter 8 verse 9 Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Here in each case there is a change of mode of existence, but not of the nature. When a poor man becomes rich, his mode of existence is changed, but not his nature as man. It is so with the Son of God. From the rich and glorious mode of existence, which was the fit and adequate manifestation of his divine nature, he, with a capital he, with a capital H, he for our sakes descended in respect of his human life to the infinitely lower and poorer mode of existence which he assumed together with the nature of man. Right. So this is what the author is trying to say. That that is how Jesus is able to become a man even though he was God. Right. Um, Is there a parallel thing in philosophy in this way? Right. Um, the Platonic shadow uh, we will, right, is something come to mind, but it's not the same here. Note 2 7. Okay, my battery is r- running low, so I guess I have to do another video for, for the next few uh, literatures. Note 2 7. But made himself of no re- reputation. The literal translation is, but he emptied himself. The question immediately arises of what did the Lord Jesus empty himself? In answering this question, one must use the greatest care. Human attempts to define this emptying have often ended by stripping Christ of his attributes of deity. Right. But my comment here would be that you have to prove first that Jesus is actually divine. Right? Then only you can say that people have interpreted him, people have interpreted this uh, verse as stripping Christ of his divinity. Right? Some say, for instance, that when the Lord Jesus was on earth, he no longer had all knowledge or all power. Right? This is uh, true because in the gospel, Jesus did not know the hour. He was no longer in all places at one and at the same time. They say he voluntarily laid aside these attributes of deity, excuse me, of deity, when he came into the world as a man. Some even say he was subject to the limitations of all men, that he became liable to error and accepted the common opinions and myth of his day. This we utterly deny. Okay, the author is saying this we utterly deny. The Lord Jesus did not lay aside any of the attributes of God when he came into the world. He was still omniscient, meaning all-knowing. He was still omnipresent, meaning he present in all places at one time at the same time. He is everywhere. Right? He is not, you know, he is bounded by time, but he is also not bounded by time. Right? He was still omnipotent, meaning he is all-powerful, very powerful. Okay. What he did was to empty himself of his positional equality with God and to veil the glory of deity in a body of human flesh. Right? So th- that is the understanding here. Yeah. And so the, the author here is basically making a very fine point here, very detailed, minute point. You might think that he is contradicting himself, but if you read carefully what he's trying to say, he's trying to say that Jesus never, okay, um, lay aside any of his divine attributes, meaning his divine attributes is still there as a human being, right? but it was veiled. So it was inaccessible, inaccessible to him. So for example, I have a lot of strength, but when I'm sick, I'm not able to use all of my strength. I'm not able to administer all of my strength, right? And so, but I have this strength in me, right? Uh, when I'm not sick, I can punch through a wall, but when I'm sick, I can't punch through a wall because I do not have the strength, right? Because my strength 
if we use this interpretation, even though I disagree, I will explain. But if we use that interpretation or analogy, it basically means that when I'm sick, right, it is, uh, is sickness or fever, for example, is a veil, right? Meaning when I'm when I'm having fever, it is like I'm I'm no longer able to assess the strength that I have, right? the ultimate strength that I have because I'm having fever, right? It's the same when Jesus became a human being. Right, this is what the author is trying to say. When Jesus became a human being, he still have these attributes, the, the, the attributes of God, omnipotent, omniscient, right, so on and so forth. But because there is a veil, and the veil is because he became a human being. And so he is not all-knowing, right? He is all-knowing, but because there's a veil, right, and so he's not able to assess his all-knowing knowledge, right? But this knowledge is still within him, but he is not able to assess it. But this is what the author is trying to say. Now, I have a lot of comments, but I'll not make comments because, you know, there's a lot of uh, refutations that I can give, but I'll not give. Um, and you have to, um, you know, read uh, research for yourself. Now, in future videos, I will revisit this and I will actually comment so on and so forth but in this video I will not um, okay. the glory was all there though hidden but it did shine forth on occasions such as on the Mount of Transfiguration there was no moment in his life meaning Jesus life on earth when he did not possess all the attributes of God yeah exactly what I, uh, I've just said now ladies, ladies and gentlemen uh, I have to end uh, the video here because my battery is running low. Um, but I will continue in part two, inshallah. Um, and we'll look at these other literatures. I'll film, I'll charge, and then I'll film, and then I'll upload these two videos at the same time, inshallah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.